One of the things I like to hit on is, you know, I didn't start doing this like buying, you know, a hundred unit buildings, you know, with $10 million. I did not have that. I came from a very simple upbringing. So for me, uh, I started with small buildings and eventually that allowed me to amass enough cash flow to allow me to retire from my, from my day job at the, uh, the ripe age of 44 years old, which That's I'm very crazy. proud of. That's a Welcome to your daily real estate syndication show. My name is Dina Berg and your host today. Today, my guest is Tony Lopes. Tony Lopes is CEO of Dirty Boots Capital. He's going to explain in the show why he calls it Dirty Boots Capital. I really liked his definition. He's a real estate professional. He's a best-selling author. He's a coach and a speaker. His background is in mechanical engineering with an MBA from UMass. He worked in the defense industry for nearly 20 years managing a multi-million dollar programs while simultaneously building a portfolio of income generating properties. He's a first generation American and he loves more than anything is sharing his knowledge and experience so that others can achieve financial independence and enjoy the same level of freedom that he did. I know we're going to have a great show today. Welcome, Tony. This is Tony Lopes. He is our guest today from Dirty Boots Capital. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Dina. This is going to be a fun conversation. I'm excited. As we mentioned, we just were kind of doing some pre-show prep. I love anyone with a Boston accent. I picked it up three <laughs> seconds into the convo. Pure entertainment for me. The, the East Coast is a little bit like a foreign country. I'm a Seattle West Coast girl, even though I live in Denver now. So it's kind of like watching an amusement park, you know, just the East Coast. I love it. We, we, could, we could create a show just with my, my crazy <laughs> accent, my crazy Boston accent. That could be a, a 30-minute show right there. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Most of you are probably listening to the podcast, but Tony had the Boston hat on, so he makes no bones about the fact where he's from, which I love. All right. Well, Tony, let's get into this. You have a lot of experience. You know, as the show, we send our guests kind of, you know, some information, getting ready to figure out how we can best leverage the experience of our guests. Tony sends me like a nine-page bullet point. <laughs> Summary of all the things that he can share, which for me is like a total gift hosting a podcast. We can go anywhere with this. So folks, yes. buckle up. Tony, give us a little background about who you are, how you got started, and then we'll get to the now. Sure. So I, I personally like to share my story in a very relatable way to the, to the audience, to your listeners, because I, at the end of the day, we're all trying to achieve the same thing of, you know, having a certain amount of wealth, having a certain amount of freedom in our lives to be able to do the the fun things we like to do with our family. So, you know, I share with folks, I, I'm no different than anybody else. My parents actually migrated to this country prior to me being born. So they came to this country with very little. And when I was born, me, me and my siblings, they handed down the tablet of, you know, because they saw this country as a country of great opportunity, mm -hmm. they handed down the tablet of, Go to school, get a great education, you'll get a great job, and you'll be set for life, which I think many of the listeners and the viewers can, can resonate with. That's, that's a very familiar mantra that we have, right? Well, I went to school. I got a great education. I got two degrees, a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and, a, and an MBA, two great degrees. Great combo. Uh, not, right. I, I went to work at, at a great company, and then I was laid off. And I was like, well, wait a minute. This wasn't part of the mantra I was handed down from my immigrant parents who saw so much opportunity. So that was my awakening is, is really what it was. And I said, I got to do different. I wasn't financially independent at that time. You know, I had to go find another job, which uh, all of us can relate to. And so I found another job. But at that point, I said, I have to do something different. I had a little bit of familiarity with real estate investing. My father, as an immigrant, had done some real estate investing. So I had some amount of familiarity. And so that's the, 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 the route I took is part-time, after work, nights, weekends, I started investing in real estate. And I didn't start like in a huge way. I bought a, a quad, a four-unit building. Did some amount of fixing up on that, rented it out from that cash flow and that equity. You know, I still have the building today, actually. But during that time, I used that equity and I used that cash flow to start building some spec homes. Again, all while working, 
my job during the day. So I was building a couple of spec homes, you know, <laughs> nights and weekends. And from there, I took that cash flow, invested it back into the multi space because I saw the multifamily space yeah. really as a great avenue to create not only appreciation for myself, wealth for myself over a long period of time, but also this great thing we call cash flow. And so I continue to buy multifamilies again to, you know, so for your audience, one of the things I like to hit on is, you know, I didn't start doing this like buying, you know, a hundred unit buildings, you know, with $10 million. I did not have that. I came from a very simple upbringing. So for me, uh, I started with small buildings and eventually that allowed me to amass enough cash flow to allow me to retire from my, from my day job at the, uh, the ripe age of 44 years old, which That's I'm amazing. very proud of. That's amazing. <laughs> so this is the end of term, re term replacement where all of your like single family and small multis, I mean, the, the spec homes, were they all in the Boston area where you lived? They were, they were actually up in New Hampshire, just north of Boston. Yeah. So what was the time period from the time you started this till the time you were able to replace your cash flow, your income through cash flow at 44? About 15 years. Okay, that's helpful. Years. And reasonable, yeah. you know? Yeah. Again, all I, these I headlines of like, you know, zero to 2,000 units in six, eight months, you know, which is amazing for some people. But I just yeah. think I love how realistic your story is. And it's also kind of takes the tension out of it in terms of like, hey, I can do this. I'm not going to jump off into oblivion thinking I'm going to become, you know, this cash flow king or queen in six years, even, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. But I mean, six months. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, Dina. And that's, that's why I like to start there with my story, because I, I think a lot of your viewers, a lot of your listeners can relate to a lot of different aspects of that story. Right. So, but that just kind of, you know, freed up my time. Now that I've replaced my my W-2 income, my job income with cash flow, which is a very doable thing, now I can go off and do all sorts of other crazy things. And so, yeah, we can expand on all the different things I, I touch these days. Yeah. So what is Dirty Boots Capital? That's the the name of your company. But what do you guys do? How what did, Where did that fit into the timeline of the 15 years? And what does that look like now? Sure. So to break down Dirty Boots Capital, so Dirty Boots was came from the fact that you know years ago i could just walk on a job site get my boots dirty looking at the job site seeing what i have to fix in terms of you know windows doors roof whatever i could get my boots dirty just walking on a job site today things are a little different we have things like migration patterns that we need to understand so i get my boots dirty walking through those reports of migration patterns right financial reports macro reports What's happening in the in the economy today? We have to be so much more vigilant and savvy in terms of what's happening within the economy, uh, whether we're having a recession uh, it, uh, on our doorstep or not. Do we have inflation uh, it, for longer? We have to understand these things better. So I get my boots dirty walking through those types of reports. Love Separately, it. Capital. When I do my coaching, so part of Dirty Boots Capital is coaching. I provide coaching to, to folks who either want to active or passively invest. So part of the capital piece is so many people have come to me over the years and say, Tony, I don't, I don't have enough money to invest to start being an active investor and in buying real estate. I say, that's okay. Tell me a little bit about yourself and come to find out they're a contractor of some sort or they're a real estate agent or that they have some other skills that complement being an active investor. And so I say, that's okay. I get you may not have the capital. Why don't you partner as an LLC or a partnership of some sort with somebody else that does bring the capital, but may not have the time or your skills to be able to do the rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. So now that's that kind of like blows their mind and they start to think, okay, yeah. And and oh, by the way, that makes it easier when it's two people doing something, so to speak, for the first time, you're not going alone at this. So one, one person may bring the capital in terms of the money. Another person may bring the capital in terms of the knowledge, what they hold between their ears in terms of how to fix things or maybe how to list an apartment for rent 
or dealing with contracts. Whereas mm -hmm. the person with the money, maybe they just have the money and they don't really know the other piece or don't want to deal with the other piece. Mm -hmm. So that's where the dirty boots capital came from. So mm -hmm. we help people not only with the coaching that we do, but also educational blogs, videos, and also helping people with syndication, get into syndication, if that's a route they want to get into. So we never push anybody into any particular situation, but if syndication is something good for them, we help them figure that out. So I have a question about the dirty boots and what you're, the, the reports that you're wading through. Can you share any of the, the top line report titles in case anyone is interested in looking at some of those things? What's, which are the ones that you find yourself in the most? Yeah, so the one I find the most interesting that I look at pretty frequently is the 210 spread for the treasuries. It's a FRED report. And a lot of, a, there's a lot of reports put out by the Federal Reserve. They have a database called the FRED uh, database. You can go online, access a whole bunch of different reports. But I like the 210 spread report. So just Google FRED 210 spread. That report will come up. And when you look at it, it gives you 50 years of history. And so, wow, that is such a great crystal ball to be able to help us understand where we've been and where mm -hmm. we may be going in the future. And so every time we dip below the zero line on that report, it indicates a certain amount of badness. Okay. And then you can see tracking every time we dip below that line, soon thereafter, we fall into a recession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We come out of the recession, it dips below the zero, we go into another recession, it goes back up. You know, we have these business cycles. So where are we today? We're below the line. We're below zero. It's starting to track back up, which is a good sign. However, 50 years of data is telling us this is an indicator that we are going to see some sort of a recession. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that's super important to watch that, to watch that metric and help us understand where we are. We, we can't live with our head in the sand. We have to understand some of these things and why we're investing in the multifamily space. Super important indicator. Yeah, that's so uh, this is the kind of information I think listeners find really helpful is like the name of this report. Any other reports that you can share that we can point listeners to, to do their own, you know, kicking around in the dirt? Oh, I wasn't prepared for that one. Uh, <laughs> wow. So I like to look at the home ownership rate mm -hmm. and not just home ownership rate, so to speak, of what's what we're seeing in this country. I also like to look at other countries as data points, right? So right now we are at 66% home ownership rate in the United States, which, okay. However, that's trending down, right? Because of the interest rate environment. There's a lot of things that will drive that down, that chart down. So I look at that chart, but looking at other countries. So we're at 66%. I look at another industrialized country like Germany. Sometimes we compare ourselves from manufacturing base or an industrial base, we compare ourselves to Germany. Well, Germany only has a 47% home ownership rate. Huh. So they obviously have many, many, many more years on us. They're, they're a much older country. They're a very industrialized country, which makes them similar to us. But it just kind of makes you, just, just like you said, Dina, it makes you go, hmm, what does that mean for the future of the United States? Yes. Because, so, uh, look at Japan, right? A lot of headlines out there, a lot of speak is about the Japanification of America because we hold this very high debt to GDP, not as high as Japan, but we're trending in that direction. Mm -hmm. So along the lines of the Japanification of the United States, I look at, well, what's their home ownership rate? And their home ownership rate is 55%. So lower than what we have in the United States. But not trailing too dramatically, right? So, yeah. So if our home ownership rate comes down based on these other similar two environments, Japan and, and Germany, 
where do people go? They're not going to live under a bridge. They're becoming renters, right? right? And so this is where we all start to put the pieces together. Everything from charts like that, looking at the home ownership rates, but also looking at is a recession on our doorstep? Because if it is, People, society feels that and they say, well, if my job isn't either stable or, you know, or they know they're going to lose their job, then they start to say, should I really buy a house? Because when you buy a house, you, you put down roots and now you're not as mobile as you normally would be to go to a different state or a different part of the country to find work. So, or even just a nearby town, because if, you know, for, you know, having to sell a home is is not cheap these days so during a recession people are more apt to rent than they are to actually buy a home because of the economic factors involved so that's why i like to look at those different reports and try to understand are we more likely to trend in a renting type direction or home ownership and right now there's a lot of indicators indicating we're trending towards being more renters than homeowners. Right. I recently read this report. I mean, recently, like this week, we're in end of October during the time of this recording, but average home price now is higher than it's ever been at 407,000. Depending on what market you're in, that might seem like a deal and some others it might seem (laughs) really expensive, but cost of home ownership has risen 78% in the past three years. So all of that substantiates and supports this concept of renter nation. So I'm curious what you think some of the trends are economically that come along with renter nation. We have a lot of transitory employees. We have, you know, nomadic employees. Yeah. We have digital nomads. Also, I think generationally, it's much more accepted. The millennial generation, I think, is just kind of starting to settle down and maybe graduate a little bit out of that. But a lot of studies have shown that they prefer renting over owning, which is also interesting and long time accepted in the U.S. has been the one way to build wealth is to have a home ownership. So love your thoughts on that, but also yeah. kind of pivoting into where we're at right now. There's a lot of folks who are a little bit frightened to yeah. invest. This is all signs pointing to multifamily continuing to be a strong asset class to invest in. Talk about that as well as the folks who might be a little gun shy and if they should wait or if they shouldn't. Yeah, no, I, I love this. I love this. So you you gave some stati- uh, statistics about home ownership, home prices. And what I want to inject in there is we are also at the, the point where the highest, uh, the oldest age somebody is transitioning from being a renter to a homeowner the age is now the highest at 36 36 is the Mm -hmm. average age when somebody transitions from being a renter to actually purchasing their home so they're staying renters for longer what what is it then like give us perspective like five years ago what was it or do you know? Oh, I, I, I don't have the data. I don't have the data on that. On wonder how far that's trending. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you look at where we are with, with society, where we've come with simple things like, and again, these things are may go under the radar to some degree. But you look at something like Amazon, where we've been conditioned for years with next day delivery, such that if Ruined. our package that condition. Yeah, so, Ruin. We have been. Like, so, where's my package? Right. Like, if you're like waiting two days for your package, you you start to twitch, and you're like, Where, "Where's my package? And my I want my raised on this." They're like, right? "Where's package?" I'm like, "So we're conditioned. Like, we used to drive in the car. <laughs> no, we used to have to walk uphill both ways to get our package. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. And so, <laughs> so we we've been conditioned in certain ways. So. Amazon has conditioned us for next day delivery. With that has been the advent of things like Instacart, where people to some degree don't want to go shopping for their own groceries. Okay. And I'm and I'm not saying they're good people or bad people. I'm I'm not judging. I'm just saying this is how things have trended. So not only do they not want to go 
buy their own groceries. Now we have the advent of Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, where you can get food delivered to your house already prepared. So not only do they not want to buy the groceries, they don't want to prepare the food, right? So that's just kind of like where society is kind of trending. Yeah. So think about how much time do they want to spend on the weekend cleaning the gutters, cutting the lawn, painting the trim on the house. That's not where they want to spend their time. They're much more today. Society wants to be, they want to be in a place where they can enjoy themselves and have these experiences as opposed to, you know, taking care of a home. They, that's just not where the head is at. And you mentioned millennials, some of the younger millennials and, and for certain the Gen Z, they've seen their parents go through the tech bubble back in the 2000. They saw them and struggle to pay their mortgage and some lost theirs back, back then. They saw 2008 global financial crisis. A lot of folks lost their homes then. And just recently with the uh, COVID pandemic, a lot of folks, if it was not for forbearance, a lot of folks would have also lost their homes. Mm -hmm. So there, imagine in those homes, there was a lot of conversation and these kids are, are picking up on that. They're internalizing some of these conversations. Oh my God, we may lose the home. And I think that's impacting folks today where, you know, now that they're older, they're in a position where maybe they can buy a home. I think some of those scars still exist and they're saying, do I really want to be a homeowner after seeing what my parents went through? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think that weighs on them. So, so that's a little bit of what's going on with society a, a, a little bit, but also, you know, at the governmental level, we are at the highest point uh, of our debt to GDP. And that's super important. We're at like 128%. So we're spending 28% more than the income we actually bring in as a country. So what happens is we're spending more money on our interest payments. So more of what comes in as income goes towards paying those interest payments at the federal government level. Mm -hmm. What does that do? That leaves less money available to go to the states as help for education, help for infrastructure programs, help for welfare programs at the state level. So less federal money can flow to the state level. The states have to make it up somewhere. Obviously, they need to take care of education, infrastructure, welfare programs. They still need to maintain those. It needs to come from somewhere. More and more of what we're seeing these days, articles and, and just personal experiences, property taxes are on the rise. And I'm forecasting that even though, you know, home prices may be coming down some, I think more and more of what you're going to be hearing about in terms of unaffordable home ownership is going to be in terms of the property taxes. Seriously, because ours have doubled in four years alone, just in my own neighborhood. And if I didn't have the interest rate that I have, I don't know if we could live here. It right? would definitely be priced out because... It's not insignificant, you know? It, it could, I, I have one building that I own that went up, you know, uh, like $5,000 in property tax in one year, $5,000, right? Yeah. Now, it's easy to amortize that over my multiple tenants. Yeah. So sure, my rents go up, but it's easily amortized over multiple tenants. If I'm a single family homeowner and my property tax goes up significantly, I could be paying an extra two, three, four, five hundred dollars a month for yep. my property tax. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, when you look at it, that could tilt the scale between being able to afford a home and not being able to afford a home. Yeah. So I, I think that's one of the dynamics, one of the underlying things that folks may not be realizing yet, but definitely property tax increasing is going to be going to uh, perpetuate this unaffordability issue we have in this country and drive people towards renting more towards home ownership. That's interesting. Thank you for kind of panning the camera out in terms of where the increased property taxes are coming from, where that pressure is coming from. It's helpful to see the big picture. 
talk yeah. a little bit about continual investments in multifamily in light of renter nation and how does that affect or impact investors now i'm of course in investor relations and you know i talk about this often i'm in touch with folks all the time and folks are a little bit jumpy you know they're a little like i don't know or i want to wait for the big bubble to pop before i do it i'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback about how you coach your clients or anybody who's asking you what should i do yeah so one of the things and this isn't a, a sale for syndications or anything. It, it's, it's just what is, what we're experiencing these days, right? If I look to purchase a, a multifamily myself, just being an active investor, there's a lot of hurdles these days to, to jump over. Whereas because I also play in the syndication market, I look at those hurdles there and they're much less because with a syndication, it you have bigger economies of scale to sure. draw on, right? You have a better network. I just saw one syndication who was able to purchase a new building, lock down financing less than 6% with a fixed 30-year mortgage. Hey, that's 30-year, cool. uh, right? So what I said, year what I thought we've been saying, that's great. You're in a public right. home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, the typical person going to buy, like as an active, active investor, going to buy a multifamily, most likely will not get those terms. But as a syndication, because you're bringing more leverage to the table, you're bringing less less risk because as a syndication, you're typically much more savvy investors in terms of the market, the migration patterns carrying less leverage, you know, doing value add projects, you bring so much more to the table because, you know, part of it is you're not just one person as a syndication, you're usually three, four, five people as a syndication, and you're bringing so much better capital to use that term, not just yeah. money, but capital to sure. the table. So you're able to, so to speak, buy down with that capital, you're able to buy down your rate to, to something less than what an average person can do. So that's why I like partially syndications. Also with syndications, one of the things I love, we started prior to hitting the record button, we were talking about asset management. One of the things I love with syndications is when your asset manager, your property manager is also invested in your deals because that ties them in to making sure we have a very solid, well-run, good tenants, great building that, that's being operated. So that's one of the things I look for when I go and I invest or, or team with someone is where's that property manager? Are they also invested in the property as an investor of some sort? So, so you said property manager. Are you creating any kind of de delineation between the asset manager and the property manager? We, we look for the asset manager to also have skin in the game, but it, yeah, yeah, there's a delineation there. You're absolutely right. The asset manager needs to have skin in the game as well as the property manager needs to have right. skin in the game. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Yeah, man, property managers are kind of like this secret little, like they can make or break a deal, right? They really can. I mean, and it can really take, you know, again, for, for your viewers, your listeners, I'm sure some of them also have their own, do their own property management or their own asset management on some multifamilies they own. I think we know well enough that property managers can make or break you and they can make your life very hard if you don't have the right one. And so this is what a syndication brings to the table. We have these scars, right? Dina, you have these scars. I have these scars with property management. This is what we bring to the table as a syndication to be able to say, okay, let me make sure I'm asking the right questions of my property manager to make sure they bring the right bench strength to the table, to bring the right contracts and leasing agent to the table, to bring the right skills we need to the table for this particular property. Whereas some folks who may be trying to do multifamily purchases on their own, they may not know the right questions to be asking of their property manager. So when you have a property manager that you want to invest in your deal, are you putting them in the GP or are they going to be LPs? 
Yeah, usually they're in the GP. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, what, the one thing that I brought up, like you said, before we hit record is just that there were so many folks that got into this business in the last five years with all the masterminds and, and all of the, the, you know, it people can raise capital, people can even acquire deals, but I think where we're going to see a lot of the rub is in the asset management and the ability to maintain and retain an asset or a property or an investment through ongoing asset management. So love to hear if you have any other thoughts. I like what you said about getting them to invest. You've skin in the game. Everybody has, you know, the same vision and goals. Anything you've learned about creating skids or oiling the skids with that relationship? Well, one of the things I like to look for is, you know, how many turns they've they've done as as a syndicator. You know, what's their track record? I was just last... Well, I guess it was a year ago, last October, I was in a room at a conference with about 600 syndicators. And that number surprised me. I went to what the conference? event. I'm sorry? Which conference? Oh, I don't, I, I, I don't want to call oh, okay. out. I, maybe I should wait to finish the story for me to ask. <laughs> okay. Oh, 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 good. Oh. That's what this means. Well, I hate it to us. You know, I, I went to the conference. So this was pure, purely like a recon mission for me, right? Because okay. this is what I do. I do the, like, I want to know truly what's happening in the market. So sometimes I need to jump on a plane, go someplace and figure out like what's physically going on in this conference room. Like, what are these people doing? Right. So number one, my first surprise was, holy cow, there's 600 syndicators in this conference room talking about this stuff. Okay. My next data point was they were all like young. And I'm not here to say young people are bad or anything like that. Not, not my purpose. They were inexperienced in a lot of ways. And so I would have conversations with folks and, and you know, just about the work they're doing, uh, a lot of it on, or some of it on value add projects and how they're going to be able to rent an apartment for $4,000. And, you know, I had already seen the, you know, the, the market starting to turn and seeing rates starting to increase. And we start talking about, so right now you have a construction loan and and great you may you may have a great rate right now but what happens when you go to refi do you have that built into your into your spreadsheet and it was like yeah we have it built in at you know 4% or something and i'm like oh, okay a little bit of risk there not sure you're going to get a 4% rate once you refi and then also in terms of the market analysis was was weak so I think there's going to be some asset managers who came into this in the last 10 years, very inexperienced, and hopefully the investors don't get impacted. But I think that some of those new young syndicators are going to be shaken out of the market, which actually creates some opportunity for folks like you and I to come in and actually do the asset management the right way right. on some of these properties. So. Yeah. I think there's opportunity out there for new investors coming in, looking at syndications. It's just a matter of teaming up with the right syndicator with experience to see through some of this, some of this mess that's happened. Yeah, I think for us, even as a team at LifeBridge Capital, we're kind of reevaluating our business model in terms of the kind of deals we do. So value add was where it was all at. That's where you created wealth. That's where you saw these like 44% IRRs and, you know, look at our past performance. Like I am very clear with investors now. Do not look at our past performance and expect that in future. Yes, good for you. Yep. Because it's just not going to happen. And so even that, you know, a value add is still a great way to protect the downside risk, but you get to really take kind of a risk analysis of what you're comfortable with because you got to buckle your seatbelt for 12, 24, sometimes 36 months for the stabilization yeah. period. And so not that I think that's still a really viable and good model. I think one thing we're pivoting to is more of a wealth preservation model than a wealth mm. creation model. So we're buying new, nice assets, essentially revenue streams, coupon clipping, 
in very strong markets where we see a lot of population growth, a lot of jobs, great schools and things like that so that we can, yeah, just kind of plant, plant the stake down deep. But we're not going to be offering really high IRRs, but it's going to be slow and steady. And we are going to have very low leverage. And this is about preservation and slow and steady growth. This is like base hit. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and and you're, you're, you're so right. You're, you're so right, Dina. This is where we're looking at some of those same things, you know, being in cities where, where there's growth, but there's a demand. We're looking at it where there's demand for like class B type properties, nice properties where we don't have to do a lot of value add. We yeah. can kind of go in there and kind of like you say, just, you know, uh, coupon clip. Plug and um, play. Yep. Plug and play. But the the cities are experiencing huge growth. And there's there's experiences for the tenants to have in those cities. Cause that's what people are looking for these days. Society is looking for experiences, restaurants, things to do, theaters, be next to a waterfront. They're looking for yeah. these experiences. So yeah, it's and again, this is why, you know. The average Joe investor who's buying a multifamily may not be looking at things from that perspective. You and I, as syndicators, we bring so much more to the table because we look for those things. We understand where society is at, and we say, when we buy something, we need to make sure that the renters have something to do. Either we're offering a certain amount of amenities with the building, right. fitness center, pools, the hot tub, door. you know, yeah, right? I mean, we yeah. have to be thinking about that because now more and more people have pets. So when we purchase, we look for a place to either have a like a uh, dog park or someplace we can create a dog park. And so the, these are the things that are going to bring renters in to our place versus someplace else. Yes, it's a competitive advantage to have a lifestyle investment. Live, work, play. Yeah, I get it. You want something where you don't have to get in your car on a weekend to go and enjoy life. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. In fact, uh, nowadays, when I'm when I'm like going in the suburbs because my kids go to school in the suburbs, and I'm driving, and there's this brand new development, and it's all centered around this big parking lot, and I'm like, ah, uh, why didn't you make this a town center and put the parking on the outside? Yeah. You just, I, I don't understand sometimes. So somebody else can come on the yeah. show and explain why urban planners do that. It makes me crazy. But I'm a city girl, so hey. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot more single women who are renting for longer and being able to cater to that demographic to provide like in-unit laundry. Like me as a guy, like when I was growing up, I would take my laundry, I'd go to some like, you know, the, the community laundry on the, on the first floor and I'd do my laundry. Single women who the demographic shows they're, they're living as renters for longer, you mm -hmm. want to be able to put that laundry inside the apartment. Because yeah. that's what they resonate with. That's what they want. You have to offer that to them as a, a form of an amenity, right? So these are the things we look at. You know, the average, you know, person may not be looking at that, but we see that and we say, okay, I'm looking to buy this building. Can I put in-unit laundry uh, into each one of the units? Right. And looking at ways to, from the operator side, look at ways to increase the NOI. You know, you can yeah. bundle amenities, maybe even bundle utilities, maybe do the you know, fiber optics and things like that. So there's a lot of creative yeah. ways to leverage that while providing a service to your tenant. Tony, yeah. we need to wrap up in just a few minutes, but I'd love to hear if you have anything else that you want to discuss that's burning on your mind before we wrap up this great podcast. Yeah, what, so prior to hitting record, one of the things I had mentioned was, obviously I have folks who come to me for coaching and things like that. And that's not a sell. It's more from the perspective of what I'm hearing today. More and more folks seem to be paralyzed mm -hmm. and unsure what to do. The rates are going up. Should I buy? I'm hearing some negativity in the in the real estate space. You know, they're they're paralyzed in terms of what to do. What I share with them is take a moment, breathe, use this time to further your education. So you're if if you're listening to this, if you're watching this. You know, don't feel compelled to jump in right away and, and invest. That's not what I'm looking for or what Dina is looking for here. You know, 
we need sophisticated, knowledgeable investors who are investing themselves for the right reason. So take this time to educate yourself, read books, watch YouTube videos from, you know, there's many good folks out there who are sharing education around real estate investing. They're not looking for you to, if, if you're watching a video where somebody's looking for you to invest in their deal, you probably don't want to watch their videos. <laughs> watch the videos of folks that are, are educating you like, like Dina here, right? We're here. We're just chatting. We're not making Add any value. money off of this. We're, we're just trying to create value for the listeners to educate the listeners that the real estate space is still a very strong area to invest in. Be careful for the news stories you're hearing out there. Still a lot of good reasons to invest in real estate. You just got to do it right. It's it's a little more sophisticated and savvy needed, sophistication and savvy needed today to invest in real estate, hence why I'm bullish syndications. But if you're paralyzed, use this time to just kind of breathe, read a book on investing, on syndications, on real estate, watch videos, things like that to be able to help you get some clarity in terms of what's happening in the world today. That's great advice. One thing I would add to that that came to mind is the the thought of like new folks, how do I know? And there are a lot of really great online forums that you can access. Yeah. I could list a bunch here, but just go online and say online investor forum. Sometimes there's a membership, but it's really worth it depending on what their cost is. If you're new to this space, you can post something on a forum and 10 people might say, oh, I've invested with them. They're amazing. Or I've invested with them. They are falling apart. So there are, you just have to know the places to access the advice. There's investor groups. I mean, I'm also part of an investor group where we have retreats and we, we vet deals together. So a lot of folks are new to this space and they're just like, where do I go? So I would say start with an online search for an online investor forum for real estate. Start there. But what you say is right. Tony, thank you so much. You were so great. So knowledgeable. Love the accent, but talk to you all day. <laughs> You're so <laughs> kind, Dina. I appreciate you. <laughs> car guys. Who are the car guys? You know, the NPR car, the brothers. Yes. Click and clack. Yeah. I used to listen to that in high school. Isn't that funny? Anyway. <laughs> Love click my, and clack. <laughs> my heart first was so warm for the, the, East, for the East Coast accent. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. And uh, yeah. I hope that Dirty Boots Capital can add value to some of our listeners as well. Excellent. Thank you for having me, Dina. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining the show today. Again, this is Dina Berg, your host today at the Daily Real Estate Syndication Show. Hopefully we have added value to your life as an individual and as an investor. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps us with the show metrics to continue bringing you good content and quality and guests like Tony Lopes. Hope you have a blessed day.